uh, in awful circumstances around us, and most especially in some neighborhoods uh, here in New York, like in Queens. So we thought, actually, uh, who better to have this discussion with than um, Raquel, Daniel, and Sia. So this is the event. Uh, let me introduce each of them in turn. They're all friends and comrades. Each of them is a force of nature in their own mm -hmm. right. I have tremendous respect for the work that each of them does. Uh, and we're just very excited to have this conversation tonight. Uh, let me say a couple of things about each, uh, and then I will step out of the way. We're, uh, uh, Raquel is going to go first, then, uh, then Sia, and then Daniel, and then we're going to have a little bit of a discussion, and we encourage you to use the Q&A uh, channel in the chat to send in questions, and we'll try to do it uh, on the fly. You know, we're all learning how to do Zoom and basically produce little TV shows at home, so please, uh, we already, you know, please forgive us for any little glitches here and there. So Raquel Rolnick is a person who needs no introduction, but is worth introducing anyway. She's a professor, an urban planner. She has 35 years of critical scholarship behind her. She's an important activist. She has practical experience in planning, urban land policy, and housing issues. She's based in Sao Paulo. She is a professor at FAO, the Faculty of Architecture and Urbanism at the University of Sao Paulo. She has held many important governmental positions. She was director of planning department city of Sao Paulo in 1989 to 1992. She was national secretary for urban programs of the Brazilian Ministry of Cities from 2003 to 2007, and has been involved in uh, NGOs like Polis in Sao Paulo from 1997 to 2002. Most notoriously, she was also the UN Human Rights Council, as she was appointed by the UN Human Rights Council as, as a rapporteur on uh, adequate housing for six years, uh, a six years mandate, which ended in 2014. She is absolutely uh, a reference uh, for all of us who are critical scholars and activists and who are thinking about cities. We're absolutely very pleased and, and thankful to have her join tonight and hope, Raquel, that you feel celebrated uh, with this important new book on urban warfare that you've released. After Raquel, uh, Sia Weaver, who is a force of nature in another way. Uh, she's campaign coordinator for housing justice for all, uh, which is uh, known also as the Upstate Downstate Alliance. She is a remarkable activist and thinker on urban issues. And uh, in 2019, she was one of the people behind one of the most important victories for tenant rights in New York State that we have seen uh, certainly in a generation of more. Uh, welcome, Sia. And then uh, Daniel Aldana Cohen, friend, also another force of nature, assistant professor of sociology at the University of Pennsylvania. He directs the Social Spatial Climate Collaborative, or SC2, SC Squared. And people on this webinar probably know him as one of the authors of Planet to Win Why We Need a Green New Deal. And he also co hosts a podcast on climate change, Hot and Bothered. He has also been a member of the policy team for the People's Actions uh, Homes Guarantee campaign. So welcome all of you. I am going to turn off my video and I will turn it over to you, Raquel. Welcome. Hi, hi everybody. And thank you so much for this opportunity. And I hope we're gonna do that again in live at New York City after the pandemic. And after all that, um to celebrate and also to celebrate our victories around housing and the right to housing during this crisis crisis has been always always a very difficult moment but also a very um, important new opportunity in order to sometimes open grounds and open roads that before seemed completely, completely closed. So I hope that this webinar and most of it, the action that is being done around housing in the US and around the world today, will together with our very long history of struggles around houses and cities will lead us to a very important change. I, I, I want to thank especially 
to New York City DSA, uh, to NYU Urban Democracy Lab, uh, to Verso, and to the movements that are making this possible and this conversation possible. And I hope I can share with you some basic questions and issues, and maybe we can discuss that later. So, first of all, what I want to share with you is basically, is basically three ideas. One idea is that the crisis that we are living, the housing emergency that we are living, is, and we can call it a housing emergency because the health emergency is a housing emergency as well and must be understood and taken as a housing emergency, which was not created at all by the spread of the virus at all, but it has to do with a pre-existing condition in our cities, in our countries, and um, a housing crisis was there and was there for many years and uh, because the housing crisis was there for many years, now we know much more why there was a housing crisis. And we are in the position also to understand how much this state of things have created the ground now, not only for the crisis to be more acute, of course, but also making opening the ground to know where are the strings and channels that we need to move in order in a post pandemia scenario be able to reconstruct housing and housing policies and that's exactly what we need to do uh, so i will talk a little bit about this pre-existing condition and basically the content of of my book which and the main question of the of the book uh, and the main thesis of the book is that housing crisis that we can see in new york city in many cities in us in north america in many countries in europe in south america in many countries in africa in asia this global scenario this global situation of housing crisis was absolutely governmental made uh, it was um, the result of policy choices it was the result of um, certain beliefs and hypotheses on housing that spread over the world yes i'm talking about new liberalism and all the thinking that you can have anything you wish through the market and housing the market will provide adequate housing for all and that was the main credo and belief that we had for many years and the result was precisely in countries, and I can tell you the story of UK, for instance, that have never had a crisis like that since the Second World War, was living and is living through a housing emergency and a housing crisis. And the number of people that are going be, that are homeless everywhere, also it's a sign of the total, complete failure of this model. But also, in the in the in the last part of my talk i will try to talk about what happened after the financial crisis and uh when we are talking about the recovery measures that were taken after the financial crisis and also the result of those measures on housing and this is very important for us to understand in order to never never more repeat the same thing that was done uh, during 2008 uh, financial and mortgage uh, crisis so uh, and finally 
uh, in, by the end, I want to talk a little bit about the struggles around housing, the struggles around housing, which are truly at this moment global. And to put the challenge on the table, we are dealing with the global process. So how can we make our struggles global as well? How can we do that? So very briefly, I think that by now, most of the people um, know already um, what happened with housing. Housing became basically housing, the housing paradigm around the world has shifted from housing being a social policy, part of the welfare system in the countries where the welfare system existed. Yes, we are talking about few countries, not many, but also as, as a desire, as an illusion, as an idea, an ideal in other countries, as housing, as a human right, as something that uh, everybody must have, despite the income, despite the gender, despite its race or religion or whatever. So this paradigm shift was was started in the basically in US and UK, US under Ronald Reagan and UK under Margaret Thatcher, where the idea was basically uh, to dismantle any state supported policy of housing provision for all any idea of universal access to housing towards a one single model for all, which is home ownership through credit, home ownership through mortgage. And of course, we are talking about a global process. And as any other global process, uh, there is many common trends all over but in every country every particular experience of this process was very unique and dependent on the particular political economy of housing land and, and urban in each country and even in each city but we are talking what we are talking about we are talking about uh, the shift, yes, and structural adjustment, fiscal austerity has to do with that because we are shifting the idea of state debt towards the indebtedness of the people. But not only that, we basically are talking about a global process where we have a new colonial empire it's a, it's a colonial empire that is faceless, is flagless, and the name is global finance. And the built space and housing, the residential market specifically, became one important, very important playground for financial markets. And we are talking about a global market, a free, completely free flow of investments that can go without any barriers. Yes, for people there are walls and barriers for them to uh, not to, to impede them to migrate, but not for financial capital. And through digital technologies, it's very easy way to move financial capital from one place to the other place and it's just a bit. And within this bit, financial capital had amalgamated with build space, uh, creating a sort of a complex, a complex which is the real estate financial complex, one single thing, where build space and housing in it 
instead of being a place to live, instead of being a portal that people can use, and this is the definition of housing as a human right, a portal for somebody to be able to access other rights, education, health, environment, transportation, uh, uh, cultural opportunities, and so on, instead of being there, became basically housing a vehicle for financial capital in this very big and gray cloud of financial capital which is floating around the globe and looking for where to park and housing became one of the preferred places to park and that happened through different phases and different moments in different countries but also if we take uh, in Europe and also in North America the first wave which coincided with massive privatization of public housing in many countries uh, was also the transfer of funds and this was so clear in the, in the case of US the transfer of public funds from funding public housing towards tax exemptions for home ownership and other and other regulations like that in order to open ground for this financial capital to park but this has also a territorial dimension because that meant massive processes of displacements and dispossession and i'm talking about the public housing that were demolished in order to open ground to new developments that are not meant to the poor but i also am talking about and then shifting completely to the south to the self-built settlement of low-income people like we have in most cities in latin america that had to be evicted in order to open ground to this new development so-called modern so-called with better conditions but literally banishing low-income people low middle class from cities and i could go on and on with explanation uh, about about how that come and how in different countries that had different policies but basically uh, we can see at a global level many different countries adopting the same approach the idea that with proper credits and and in the case for instance in african cities and in latin american countries and and uh and african countries with heavy subsidies from the state everybody can have a home uh, and uh everybody was very very happy um and the links between homes and depths of the homes link it together the life of families and people to those financial markets and when there was a crash of the of those markets it was at the end of the day the people that were living in the homes that lost their homes that lost their possibility to stay put and basically became homeless and then if we if we think about the crisis and the financial crisis the response to the crisis in a lot of countries was to bail out banks to bail out financial actors and just leave all the people behind but more perverse than that a second wave of financialization of housing came with the so-called devaluated stock of homes after uh, the financial and mortgage crisis became very attractive to whom to the same investment funds to the same financial players that became global corporate landlords that bought part of this stock and put this stock 
to rent. This was one, not, not the only one, but one of uh, the ways by which rental housing became also the next playground for financial capital to play. Other mechanisms um, like Airbnb and digital platforms and all and different ways by which financial capital enter into the rental market also uh, has transformed completely the affordability and possibility for the people to rent their homes uh, or to stay in the neighborhoods, in the communities they used to live. Again, we are talking of, of built space not being th thought as, a, as places to live, but only as a very extractive way of providing to financial capital more interest and more and more and more money. So we are talking about a global crisis where we can see a, a rise in the number of homelessness, but also at the same time, the criminalization of homelessness um, and the criminalization of poverty as another mechanism that adds to this mechanism saying that those who are not able to pay their mortgages, those who are not able to be homeowners, they failed and this is a personal fail. And more than that, any other way of organizing life, like squatting, like trying to live in a different way, in collective way, has been more and more criminalized and set aside or either um, all the tenure relations, all the traditional tenure relations, which are not only the one and only home ownership model has been residu residualized and also uh, criminalized. So in this way, you have also a biopolitical mechanism that put all the desires of the people around this policy and their actual dispossession that they are living are not lived as something that is extracting and exploiting, but as a personal failure. So, uh, of course, there is many examples of, of dif different ways in which in different countries uh, that is happening, but we basically can summarize saying that we are talking about massive process of dispossession and massive process of displacement and housing policies became one of the main important policies that provoked that in our cities, in our countries. And uh, of course, struggles emerge everywhere. And we can say, oh, the important struggles that were organized, for instance, in Spain towards foreclosure homes and then now around rent. All the very important struggles that are going on in the States around rent long before uh, the virus, all the struggles uh, uh, around um, the quest for freezing rents, the quest for more public housing, the quest for regulating rents uh, and trying to cut the speculative nature of housing, they are very, very meaningful and they were very, very meaningful and they were getting momentum in different places when uh, the virus and the pandemic came. So now, of course, uh, we have a situation where uh, the housing the so-called housing problem became not only more acute because 
because of the economic and financial impact of the pandemic, lack of work, lack of salaries, people that are not making any income, not making any, any money, cannot pay the rent. So more and more people are unable to pay the rents, more and more people are unable to pay their mortgages, more and more people are in danger of homelessness. But there is a contradiction here, there is a paradox here. And the paradox is that there is one consensus, except, from the, except for uh, the Brazilian president, Bolsonaro, that don't think isolation is a good policy and claiming everybody to go to the street. But beside him, even Donald Trump has invested in social isolation. And the idea is stay home. But how can a family stay home is if the family is under threat of eviction because of foreclosure or because of rent arrears or because of lack of, of, of possibility to pay any form of house or rent. So now we have a very important ground to claim to freeze the rent. We have a very important ground to claim that nobody can be put out of his own home. That is very essential for health reasons to stay home, to stay put. But also what became very clear during the pandemic, so one side is to stop any sort of eviction, uh, but another side is also and what happened with, with those who are living at the streets with homeless people what is happening with those who are living under very precarious housing conditions like overcrowding that were going up and up and up in many many cities and many countries how can you uh, be isolated how can you care about you and your family under conditions of overcrowding or not enough sanitation or ventilation. And this is the case of informal settlements in Brazilian cities, in Latin American cities, in some Asian cities, but also is the case of some low-income neighborhoods in many cities, in migrant neighborhoods, in many cities. So it's a reality. So these housing conditions now come to surface because now it becomes very clear that it's not possible to live under such condition. And the virus is very clear. Under overcrowding, you're going to die. <laughs> it's impossible because it's contagious. So again, now, we have two paths here. Uh, one path is to come again in a very hygienic perspective and very repressive perspective, say, okay, after the pandemia, let's destroy all the low-income neighborhoods and let's, let's build new homes again, not for all who, who are there, but of course, for those who have better incomes and greater incomes. Or we have another alternative. And the other alternative, I think, is the one that we have stick on now, which is a global struggle around housing, around the right to adequate housing as a fundamental right, and a global quest for reorganizing our cities, reorganizing our communities for us, with us, and from the territories that we have and trying to ameliorate and create better conditions to stay put in better health conditions. I think the pandemic is an opportunity now to show that, to show the failure of the policies and to show a way uh, that, we can, that we can lead now, that we can go now, which is the way to change. 
Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, that was a really good transition to what I'm gonna talk about, which is um, how we are organizing under COVID-19 for a homes guarantee. Um, so I think that gave us a lot of historic perspective about the role that government and real estate in our society over the last 40 years in particular, and some of the deep ideological underpinnings of the relationship that we have to, um, to property and how that is completely at odds with the human right to housing. So my name is Sia. Uh, John Paulo introduced me earlier, but I'll just share a little bit more about who I am. Um, I'm the statewide coordinator of a coalition of over 70 organizations that are doing grassroots housing organizing of tenants and homeless New Yorkers in New York State. And I'm also a member of New York City DSA. Um, so I'm here today to talk about, um, you know, we were initially going to be talking about our fight to guarantee every New Yorker a home. Um, that's basically the idea that in a city and a state that is as rich as New York, there is no excuse for homelessness and there is no excuse for evictions. Um, in particular, in housing justice for all, we are particularly focused on the right to the rights of renters and the rights of people to for to have a home. Um, we don't actually spend a lot of time talking about home ownership and talking about um, the rights of homeowners for many of the reasons that Raquel mentioned. Um, but one of those is, of course, that, you know, our entire democracy is structured around the rights of homeowners. And we thought that there was a big gap in public policy um, that left those who live in social housing um, that left uh, renters and that certainly didn't provide for homeless New Yorkers. So um, that's sort of the background of like our organization. And like Tom Paulo said, we have done a lot of, we have a very successful track record of advocating and to strengthen and expand tenants' rights. So last year um, we were successful in passing through uh, strong, strong reforms to our state system of rent control. Um, and there, these are reforms that, you know, on the one hand, they feel like, um, on the one hand, they are radical reforms that really do mitigate the power imbalance between renters and landlords in New York State. And on the other hand, they just catch us back up to where we were um, in the late 80s or early 90s when uh, sort of a couple of the real estate industry and the right wing in New York State uh, poked weakening legislation in, weakening holes in our renters' rights framework. And the year that they did that, um, that meant that the system would really self-destruct. And the same year that they did that, they passed model legislation in 36 other states that made rent control illegal. Um, so there is a deep history of anti-renter policy in the United States, and there is a deep history of using moments of crisis and using moments of financial crisis to sort of uh, to, I, I guess the word would maybe be like retrench to like, uh, I'm probably using that wrong, but um, moments of crisis to really protect property owners, to protect, uh, to fight for austerity and to fight against an expansion of um, social justice program, social, social spending programs that could really make sure that everybody um, has a home, for example. Um, but the other thing about moments of crisis is that moments of crisis are when you can also demand and win big things. So we've seen that throughout history um, and we are hopefully seeing that right now. So I am gonna spend the next 10 minutes or so just talking a little bit about um, what we're fighting for in this moment um, and how what we're fighting for can provide the path and the sort of guide map to get into uh, a guaranteed home for every New Yorker, but also a guaranteed home for everybody, period. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about um, how we're doing it. Um, so in this moment, we are fighting for our demand to, to basically to cancel rent, to cancel mortgages, and cancel utility payments um, for everybody. We think that all rent, mortgage, and utility payments accrued during the COVID-19 crisis should be automatically forgiven and never owned, owed. <laughs> While um, an eviction moratorium, which is something that we've won in New York, is really critical during this crisis, um, we actually think that it really doesn't go far enough. Um, an eviction moratorium is something that really kicks the can down the road. 
Um, we are preparing in this moment, in this moment when thousands and thousands, even millions of people cannot pay their rent because they lost their income. We are preparing for a wave of evictions that we've never before seen unless something happens. Um, so there is like, we are in this moment where the system is like on the verge of crumbling. We are in this moment where we're seeing just how, um, just how fragile the relationship is between like tenants and then landlords and then lenders and then like the entire state. So we're in this moment to demand big things. And one of those things we're demanding is just like a suspension of our obligation to pay rent. Um, that suspension needs to be universal and it needs to not be subject to tenants providing proof or documentation. Um, there's a lot of reasons why that's really important. I think the two main reasons is one, that this crisis impacts people who work in the gig and informal economy the most. And those are folks who are not going to be able to prove a loss of income. And two, um, it's important to make sure that any program is accessible to undocumented New Yorkers who typically are unable to ap apply for the same sort of um, rent assistance programs that you might typically think of think about. Um, and so when we talk about cancel rent, we're not talking about, you know, a universal voucher program or a program to help people pay the rent. Um, those are some of the sort of pretty conservative policies that were pushed through like by the Nixon administration that really are ways to sort of uh, hijack the social welfare state and use it to transfer wealth to landlords um, and use it to subsidize private profit. What we're really talking about is we're talking about asking landlords to eat the cost of the fact that like we can't pay rent for two to three months. Um, so we're calling for a full automatic universal forgiveness there. Um, that being said, we also want to use this moment um, so to expand access to social housing. So we think a strong cancel rent policy would also come with emergency relief for existing social housing. So public housing, subsidized housing, not-for-profit housing, um, as well as things like community land trusts and other sort of forms of housing that exist off the, uh, off the uh, speculative market. Um, we do think that there is a need to sort of subsidize ongoing operating for buildings that are, that are providing some social good. Um, and then in addition to that, as millions and millions of buildings don't pay rent because they can't, um, you know, landlords are going to lose income. Landlords are going to want to leave the market. Lenders are going to want to leave the market. There will be some sort of like ripple effects on the sort of health of the U.S. residential um, economy. And the idea is that we have a massive, we're sort of calling, we're calling it reclaim our homes. We're calling it buyouts, not bailouts. But the goal is to use this opportunity to recapture, to like wrap our arms around all of these distressed assets and to pull them into the universe of social housing with strong regulatory agreements, strong uh, tenants' rights, gold standard programs. So, you know, if I'm a landlord and, you know, 40% of my tenants are not paying rent and I can't make my mortgage payments and I can't make my utility payments and I want to get out of this real estate market because, you know, I, spe I speculated on this building in Crown Heights, but it's not really working out for me, so I want to get out. Um, we want the government to buy out that landlord and to convert that building into social housing. Um, and we think that we're in a moment where we can be demanding that and doing that at scale. Um, so what we're really calling for then is like one, cancel rent, two, invest in social housing and, and uh, tenants rights, and then three, expand the universe of social housing. All of this needs to be done in the, in the span of the next three to six months. So, um, you know, we're talking about one of those moments where decades and decades of history happen all at once. Um, we're talking about one of those moments where we are taking either like a great report or something and we're, or we're just like not doing anything. Like we're just keeping the current status quo. So we think that if, if you, we are organizing in this moment because COVID-19 has sort of reawakened the political imagination of millions of renters, um, to believe in a world without rent hikes and a world without evictions and unsafe living conditions, um, and to believe that that is possible. Housing court in New York State is closed for the first time in housing court's history. We're winning transformative things day by day and we're doing it at a pace that is extremely terrifying. However, um, we could also entrench in this moment. We could, uh, a recovery, we could also just, you know, give people temporary rent assistance to make sure they stay housed to prevent some evictions, but then be back on the same place that we were, you know, three, three weeks ago.
we don't want to go back to the place that we were at three weeks ago. Um, we just, we just don't. Three weeks ago, 92,000 people in New York were homeless. Three weeks ago, our public housing was owed $40 billion just in New York State. Three weeks ago, 5.5 million renters didn't have the right to renew their lease and were living like at their landlord's whim, just one paycheck away from an eviction. And so we don't want to go back to there. Um, and that's like a really critical moment because as we are thinking about transformative solutions to COVID-19, we need to be thinking about how our crisis response uh, provides us a path and the building blocks for the world that we actually want to live in. Because weeks ago, even though we had like more restaurants and bars in the world that we believe in, the world that we want to live in, and it's not a world that's like fair, equitable to renters or to homeless New Yorkers. And mostly those folks are people of color. So that is a world that is completely um, divorced from the reality that we're fighting for. Um, so in this moment when we can be demanding impossible things and we can be um, calling for like a more just society, we also think it's a moment to like take aim at corporate profits. We're not afraid to say in this moment that you know, speculation on real estate is not part of the solution. It's actually part of the problem. Um, and we need to be asking to just like circle back around to Raquel, Raquel's talk. Our sort of neoliberal state has facilitated the wealth hoarding of private real estate developers for at least 40 years, if not longer. Um, so asking them to pay more in this crisis if they take if we if they can't collect rent for four months they still will have been stealing our wealth for over 40 years and so there's like a there's like a there's a basic idea about like how are we like actually resetting like the state's relationship to the real estate industry in this moment and the state's relationship to renters in this moment um so that is uh basically what we're calling for um and i want to talk a little bit about like how we are calling for it um because you know, we need to actually think about how we're calling for this in a way that is like building a mass movement. Um, so just for some context, prior to, uh, I would say three weeks ago, you know, we are a statewide coalition of over 70 organizations. We could mobilize at any given day, probably about 20, uh, like on a random day, like 100 to 500 people, but on like a, day where a lot of people are taking action and that we work for for a long time we could probably max out at mobilizing around like 2500 people to like come out to a mass event or an action um we had a mailing list of about 7000 people today our mailing list is over 100,000 people we have thousands of people who have agreed to take action with us, um, either organizing their building, signing petitions, or making calls to Governor Cuomo. The sort of like scale and interest of people who like want to join the housing movement today is um, exponentially greater than it was three weeks ago. So it's our responsibility to think about how are we like creating a movement that is welcoming to all of those people because we need absolutely all of those people to win. Um, it's a multiracial, multigenerational movement, and we are trying to create a class of renters who are willing to stand up to the real estate industry in this moment and to say, we don't want to pay rent, we can't pay rent, we're not going to pay rent, um, and we're demanding something different. Um, so what can you do to get involved, and like, what are some of the things that we're doing to get involved? So we called we signed a petition to cancel rent uh, and to reclaim our homes to governor cuomo um so that's the very first thing if you haven't done it you can sign that petition um the next step that you can do to get involved is you can tell your covid 19 housing story one of the things that we're struggling with in this moment is how you can actually get how can we create the, the social justice housing movement requires people coming together, but we're in a moment when we can't come together so we're trying to create online communities we have closed Facebook groups, we're doing Zoom town halls and community meetings, we're asking people to organize in their building. We've created a rent strike guide for organizing in your building under COVID-19 conditions. And we are collecting stories from tenants across the state so that you can visualize your story in the context of millions of other stories. And they're going up on this map that I'll um, put in the chat. Oh, shoot. Uh, I just put a typo. This is what you get when you try and talk and type at the same time. 
Um, so, so we're creating stories. So step one, sign a petition and ask 10 friends to do it. Step two, tell your COVID-19 housing story and make sure you share a picture. It's a lot. If you don't want to share your own picture, a picture of your house or your cat or something that's meaningful to you, um, your story is a lot more powerful if people can visualize it. We need to put a face to the fact that 30% of renters didn't pay their rent. Governor Cuomo knows 30% of New Yorkers didn't pay their rent. He doesn't care because he doesn't know who you are. So like putting a face on that is really critical to our organizing and storytelling strategy in this moment. Um, and then the third thing we're asking people to do is we are asking people on May 1st whether you can pay rent or can't pay rent not to pay rent. And we're asking you to do that in solidarity with the millions of New Yorkers who can't pay. Um, and we're asking you to do it knowing that you will not be taken to court on May 15th or May 30th. Housing courts are closed until at least June 20th. There is no rush to pay your rent, but we need to increase the number of people who aren't paying their rent because they can't or in solidarity and talk to your neighbors about not paying rent, organize a tenants union in your building, um, use mutual aid networks that you're committed to or a part of um, to really talk about how can we not pay rent? How can we talk about the fact that I'm not paying rent alone, you're not paying rent alone, it would be more powerful if we weren't paying rent together. Um, so we are doing, those are like basically the three asks, sign the petition, tell your story, don't pay your rent, and talk to your neighbors in any way you can about all of that. Um, and if you sign the petition, you will get plugged into our mailing list, so you will hear about next steps you can take. Um, and the last thing I will say is that this is a tremendously powerful moment. It's a tremendously scary moment. You have to remember that um, the person who is in the White House is and foremost a New York City landlord and that our enemies are so powerful but our enemies rely on our consent and we're in a moment where we can actually be collectively withdrawing our consent and we can be doing that in a safe way and we can be doing that in an organized way and we can be doing it and it's risky any any big thing that anyone has ever won takes an immense amount of risk but we actually don't have a choice right um, this is like one of those moments where you can pick, like, what are you going to do? We don't actually have a choice. People aren't paying rent. The only option is to, and the government is going to either protect the investors or protect the renters, and we have to force them to do the second thing. Um, so that's all I have. I really hope that you do, you know, and I do hope that like, you know, if we win in this moment, we are setting us up on like a totally different path and a totally different future. And I feel very hopeful and very scared, um, but happy to um, be here and to talk to you all about it. Um, so that's Great. Um, thank you so much, Sia. Um, apologies, my background has gotten a bit hazy. Um, let's see if we can fix this very quickly. Um, there we go. Uh, none. Okay, well this, um, this is too complex, so we're gonna skip it. Um, whoa, okay. So um, you saw what was there before. What was there before was the Karl Marxhof, which is a giant and beautiful social housing complex in Vienna. And why I've chosen it um, is for this reason. I completely, uh, of course, agree with what Sia has proposed. I think uh, Raquel's, um, History and context is absolutely fantastic. And I often talk about the housing movements in Sao Paulo and how they've influenced me and some of the work I've been doing um, here in the US, but that's not necessary. Um, Raquel is here and Sia has given us a fantastic account of the kind of organizing in the trenches. So what I wanna do is draw some lessons from how Vienna built its social housing program uh, in the ashes of the horrifying crisis of World War I and its aftermath and some lessons from that experience that can guide us in our reconstruction, um, the kind of multi-year effort that it's gonna take to get out of this crisis and to also do that in a way that's tackling climate change and tackling the long-term housing emergency. As Sia and Raquel both said, going back to February or March or January 2020 isn't an option, is not an option. Um, so in 1919, after World War I uh, ended, via Austria and Hungary split up and a bunch of different things happened, but an important one was this. Um, all the coal 
uh, that we were used in factories um, in Austria was in Hungary. And for Austria to continue to do any manufacturing whatsoever, they had to import expensive coal. And what this meant was that if their exports were going to be competitive, they needed to cut costs somewhere. And they had really three different groups um, of options of who could, who could, um, who would just take it, who would bear the burden of this transition. And those options were workers, um, productive industry, and landlords. And what they decided was to polarize against landlords. They imposed savage rent control. And the idea was that if you kept rent extremely low and refused to allow rent to go up, then you didn't need to pay as high wages and you could sell your manufacturers um, at a competitive price. So the first core lesson uh, that the Austrian Social Democrats, and in particular in Vienna, that the Viennese Social Democrats took, was the landlords are going to eat it. And they did it by polarizing the other sectors of society into a hegemonic block uh, and to polarize against landlords. And I think that's something we should strongly consider doing here, and I'll come back to. Indeed, the second thing that they did, and I'm going to give you a list of these lessons, is they taxed real estate intensely, um, and they taxed it very progressively. Um, Austria, um, had uh, Vienna, rather, had a number of, of workers who were not, were not housed, you know, th tens of thousands of workers with no adequate housing. They needed to fund their social housing program. What did they do? They taxed real estate so progressively that the top 0.5% of the properties paid 40% of the tax. Top 0.5% of the properties paid 40% of the tax. Second, they taxed rich people more generally. They taxed luxuries like racehorses and champagne. And overall, in Vienna, about a third of the funds for public housing construction came from luxury taxes. Um, and in a time of climate change, this is also important. We keep talking about a generic carbon tax as if a working class person driving your pickup around is the cause of this crisis. And it's not. Globally, the top 5% use more energy than the bottom 50%. Um, and so we need a tax sadism for the very rich. Red Vienna's uh, finance minister, a renegade banker called Hugo Beitner, was called literally a tax sadist, um, right? It's about raising money and it's about changing the power balance. Um, and by the way, the public housing that they were building was designed to cost 3% of a semi-skilled worker's salary. The fourth lesson is you have to build. Um, we need new housing. The Homes Guarantee Campaign that C and I are both um, a part of, the Homes Guarantee Campaign uh, believes that we need 12 million new units of social housing in the next 10 years. In Red Vienna, they built housing for 10% of the city's population in roughly a decade. 64,000 units housing 200,000 people. And we can build uh, a lot and we can do it uh, in a way that drives sustainable construction methods that don't cause carbon emissions and that actually help with a regenerative economy. The fifth lesson is to build in a multi-purpose way. If we are going to construct things um, with physical labor, with financial resources, uh, we need to do it in a way that is efficient and that meets multiple different needs at the same time. So now we call this multifunctional social, uh, infrastructure. Back then, they just called it social housing. In, um, in Vienna's housing, um, the building that was behind me before when the background was working, the Karl Markshof, which is kind of the jewel of Red Vienna's housing construction, that one complex not only had apartments, uh, 1,200 apartments, it had laundries, a dental clinic, a health insurance office, a maternity clinic, a library, a youth hostel, a post office, a pharmacy, 25 other uh, commerces, including a restaurant and including a showroom of something called Best, all caps, B-E-S-T, which was the city-run furnishing and interior design service um, to help working people uh, basically fill up the space in their, in their gorgeous new apartments. The courtyards alone of the Karl Marx off covered 31 acres. 80% of the lot coverage was courtyard. And people complain about modernist superblocks. I've been to the Karl Marx off in Red Vienna. It's beautiful, it's intimate, and it's full of now bike sheds. Um, and by the way, the Green New Deal for public housing bill that um, AOC and Bernie Sanders introduced has a similar spirit. They talk about, for instance, having uh, small shops where people, residents of public housing and other community members can buy affordable organic food. And you might smile and laugh. This is actually an idea that's already occurring in Brazil. Um, in Greater Sao Paulo, in São Bernardo, a suburb which, where Lula was, um, became a famous labor leader, uh, there is a, a housing movement that's building a complex right now that's got a deal already with the landless movement to sell organic food at least once a week. So this is absolutely something that we can and should do and learn from, from Sao Paulo. Um, we should build everywhere, sixth lesson. Uh, today, the great planning critic, Sam Stein, uh, obviously a friend of the, the DSA and, and, and Jacobin, um, talks about the need to build density 
and to prioritize that, that construction in wealthy neighborhoods so that we're not just upzoning poor neighborhoods. Um, and he's right. Uh, in Red Vienna, they purposely built public housing in every single zip code so that no one could be discriminated against based on their address, which is something, by the way, that the right hated, um, but the social democratic majority of working people getting homes overpowered them. Seventh lesson is employ workers. Um, Viennese social housing is interesting. It has a kind of old fashioned look. And for that reason, it was mocked by the aesthetic uh, socialist elites all around the world in places like Frankfurt and Berlin. They thought, oh, the new socialist housing should have a unity of vision. It should just be all clean lines and square boxes. But actually the Viennese socialist um, government uh, and their, their political leaders cared a lot more about giving their craftsmen jobs, doing the work that they knew how to do very well, than they cared about the aesthetic preferences of urban hipsters in other cities. Um, so putting workers to work, when you have craftspeople, define the, the skills and capacities of those without work and put them to work. Eighth lesson is ignore centrist think tanks based in Washington, DC. In 1934, the Brookings Institution visited Vienna. They wrote a report about it, and they said that the housing was extravagant, that it was a waste of money. They said that Vienna would have been, would have been more efficient and intelligent if instead of building this beautiful public housing for 10% of its population, they had built concrete boxes for workers in the suburbs. Um, and the Brookings Institute um, was not the only people who thought this. So did the fascists who won Austria's civil war. In fact, the fascists stormed into Vienna and they literally shelled the Karl Marxhof and other public housing complexes, which they called red fortresses. This was their decisive blow in the civil war um, in Vienna. And indeed, the political architect of Red Vienna's housing program uh, called Dannenberg was killed, murdered in Auschwitz in 1942. So housing is a matter of life and death, but don't be on the wrong side of history with the Brookings Institute. Um, the ninth lesson is never change uh, when you have something good going. After World War II, um, the spirit of Red Vienna continued. The city continued to build a lot of very good public housing. They adopted important feminist urban planning practices around principles of social reproduction that we talk about here today. Um, right now in Vienna, a third of the city's housing is public. A third of the city's housing is cooperative. A third of the city's housing is private market. It's relatively dense. The housing is available to people of all classes. They started to impose caps on the highest reaches of the upper middle class to get into public housing, which is unfortunate, but it still remains a far more universal, universalistic program than what we have in the United States, which of course helps to create um, buy-in. Um, Vienna is consistently ranked the world's most livable city. It has some of the highest public transit use in the world, and that's connected to the fact that social housing is built throughout the city, and Vienna's per capita carbon emissions are minuscule. So those were nine core lessons. Um, now, in a different talk with more time, I would tell you all about how close we came to this vision in the United States, how some of the socialist and cooperativist housing, even some of the philanthropic housing in New York in the 1920s and 30s were very similar to this model, that the Public Works Administration came close to something like this model, but they were defeated by the real estate industry, which in the United States in the 1930s, the real estate industry imposed a two-tier housing system where most public money went to support mortgages for middle and upper class white people and built lower quality public housing for um, working class people and increasingly black and brown working class people. Indeed, the real estate industry by 1937 had already won uh, rules that limited the amount that could be spent per unit of social housing. Um, so we have to kind of in some ways undo that pact from the 1930s. Okay, so what are the lessons I think that we can take as we start to advocate for a green, and I would argue like a red green reconstruction out of this crisis once it's safe to get back to work. First, the foundational genius of Red Vienna is to polarize against landlords, attack them for being unproductive, attack them for being unproductive in contrast to industry. And while we in the United States are not gonna rebuild the entire economy out of manufacturing, um, that ship has sailed, we do wanna be productive. There are things that we wanna make. Um, we wanna make housing, sustainable, no carbon housing. Um, we need many, many more workers to do that work. We need many more workers in farm fields doing very good work uh, under good conditions, growing good food that doesn't have the zoonotic uh, transfer of viruses between animals and humans. We need those farmers doing good work and being well paid for providing good food by workers in cities who make good wages. We need more nurses, obviously. We need more doctors, more teachers, more childcare workers, and so on. Everything that we need is the opposite of what landlordism and finance represents, and we should not be shy about making that argument. Um, Second, um, do many things at the same time. Um, there is a limit to how many resources we have, especially physical resources. 
Um, and so if we're gonna build housing, which I think we should, why not also combine that with our social policies, our environmental policies, our feminist policies, right? Everybody needs to benefit. We should see housing construction in communities as the creation of social spaces of what I would call temples of public luxury that everybody will benefit from. Um, third lesson is that this, we can't just build new housing. We have a lot of housing. Right now, a third of Americans can't afford the energy uh, in their housing. Utility costs are the main reason that people take out payday loans. So I think we can also create a retrofit industry with the similar principles where we can actually industrialize retrofits. This is a model coming out of Holland, talking about it even in the Department of, Department of Energy in the US. We can kind of industrialize retrofits and we can have uh, an ethic of care and repair for our housing, bringing the housing stock we have up to standard using public investment to ensure that all low-income housing is healthy, um, is affordable to operate, has the cleanest, most modern, most healthy, most efficient um, appliances and HVAC systems so that homes are cool in the summer and warm in the winter. Um, and finally, again, I think this notion of public luxury is what we should um, aim for. It's the same notion as you have in, in Vienna. If you, it is the lesson, basically, if you take from the rich and you build from below with working class people in charge, um, you are not going to get the concrete shacks. Um, that's the stereotype of the left, but is in fact the vision of the Brookings Institute and other centrists in DC. No, what we will have when we are in charge, when the left and when socialists um, through organizations like DSA are leading the agenda, we will use our resources to create public amenities that benefit workers, benefit their communities, um, and finally provide stability and safety to people's lives in a time of economic turmoil and increasingly a time of climate turmoil. So I've talked really quickly um, at you, but I wanted to put these ideas on the table. And I think along with the very, very essential organizing in the trenches right now, the need to think also in a longer term sense about what will be the kind of red green reconstruction um, that we try to undertake in the months and years ahead as we recover from this crisis and tackle the climate emergency. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel. Thank you, Sia. Thank you, Daniel. Really uh, such inspiring and smart uh, presentations. And I, I suppose th there's a thread running through all three of them. So Raquel was giving us this broad historical view about neoliberal policies that have led us to the disaster that has now become more evident. Sia was talking to us about the organizing strategies and day-to-day and -day, uh, fighting uh, here in New York State and around the United States. And Daniel was presenting to us uh, the example of Vienna as a way to illustrate some of the Green New Deal uh, kinds of policies as a way to bridge those two things. So the, the one, as, as in, in the last couple of weeks, as we've been talking more seriously about canceling rent, uh, we have had, uh, I've been engaging in sort of surprisingly serious policy discussions about what that might look like. And one of the sticking points is that we think I think, I agree with Daniel and all of you, that landlords, and especially the corporate landlords, need to absorb the social cost. You know, a cancel rent should not just mean public funds going to slum lords in the Bronx for providing crappy housing, right? Um, so, so the, but, the, the, um, but when we talk about that in, in a more policy way, even with our more progressive elected officials, that's when the skepticism comes up. So the, the question I have for Raquel, for Sia, and for Daniel is how do we fight the power of landlords? Uh, there's a, I, I spoke with an Obama era HUD official a couple of days ago who said, look, the United States is locked into the landlords have so much power and they built it in up and down the system and they own half of the elected officials and there's all kinds of laws and regulations in their favor, how do we begin to undo that very real power so that we can go from cancel rent on May 1st to this longer term vision of, build, of building public goods? And Raquel, I would actually like to hear you since you have butted heads with landlords in Sao Paulo and in Brasilia. 
what does that fight look like and, and how do we win it? Uh, yeah, this is the question because we are not, we, we are fighting against, I would say, a coalition. It's not only landlords, it's a coalition made of landlords, which means uh, the invested capital in real estate seeking for yields and interests for a, a very long time. With all the financial uh, capital system that is behind it, for instance, if you think that uh, the workers' pension funds, our money, our savings, is the number one investor in real estate in US <laughs> and in a, in a global uh, picture as well. So we start thinking that my money, your money, everybody's money, we are trying to save our little money in order, in order to protect our retirement. And our money is together with this gray cloud, uh, with petrodollars and Chinese plutocrats and Russian plutocrats. So I think it's a more deep question uh, around it because it's not just the landlord as a particular agent, but it's the whole system of how we organize our lives in a way that we are caught in this trap. So how can we dismantle this trap? So I would say that there are two, two issues here. One is, and I, it was super pleasure to hear Sia saying, one is to build a new strength, to build a new strength through mobilization and action mobilization to port your cause but also direct action like a rent strike or other moves like seizing empty buildings and empty places in order to transform them already in actual homes and then staying put and struggling to stay put so one thing is to build another strength a strength that also uh, takes the relationship or, or the bonds between people and the territory they occupy through other means of tenure, like community land trusts, cooperatives, cooperative housing, in a way that we are building new relations and new forms for our capital to circulate and our capital uh, to protect ourselves in the future. So I think this is very important and uh, to dismantle uh, this coalition that of course is deeply entrenched, not only in the US, but everywhere. But also I have a question. Uh, more and more you have also global and international flows intervening on that, not only local. So how can you deal with that? And this is a question for Daniel and Sia, how a struggle can connect with other struggles in other places in other countries. Sorry, Gianpaolo, for <laughs> jumping a question on that. Yeah. I mean, so how do you beat the real estate industry? Um, uh, I don't know. Um, but I think we're starting to figure some things out. Um, I agree that it's like the sort of like devil's coalition of like political validators and people with money. And I think something that's like important to say is like, it's not like, hi, uh, you know, Daniel's Andrew Cuomo and I'm my landlord and like here, Daniel, here's like a pot of money. Like that's like not what is happening here. It's, there's a lot of ways that the real estate industry controls like every level of government and it's deeply ideological. And it starts with like what you learn in Econ 101, which is like rent control is bad. 
And rent control is like the example that every college student gets about why uh, supply and demand work. Of course, the reality is, is that the housing market is like one of the most inelastic markets that there is. And the idea that supply and demand should apply to the housing market is ludicrous. But that doesn't change that the very first lesson you get taught on like your second day of your second economics class ever is that rent control is bad. And so it's not just that the real estate industry has bought off our government, it's that they bought off our way of thinking and they bought off um, every single major institution and they bought off, you know, Columbia and NYU and Yale are real estate companies. And like that's true in every major city in the US and like the sort of like way of thinking that we have about private property is not, it's not a bribe. It's like, they're controlling our brains. And I like, say, I don't want to say that in a way that's like, makes me sound crazy, but it is like a big conspiracy theory that like real estate's like good. Um, and it's like, everybody is a future homeowner, right? Like everybody considers themselves to like one day want that American dream. And like, that's because like what people really, it's not that people want to exclude others from their lives. Like, I don't think that people are, there's like definitely racist out there. There's a lot of them, but like, Homeownership is inherently exclusionary and inherently about an accumulation of private wealth on the backs of like private uh, on the backs of others. But that's not what we're thinking. We're thinking that we want healthcare, we want education for our kids, and we want that education to be high quality and free, and we want that healthcare to be affordable. Then I want to make it to college. We've created a democracy that means that the only way you can get those things is if you're basically a single family homeowner in the suburbs. And so that's like manipulated every single individual decision that we are making. Um, but I think that we're actually on the verge of change. And so to be like very hopeful about like how we like the industry and that like sort of very entrenched way of thinking that it's not bribes, like it's not, it's, but you know, we are experiencing a brand new class of renters who like for like my generation of people who graduated from college in like 2008, 2009 at the height of a foreclosure crisis, who saw our parents losing their homes, we are and who like have tons of medical debt and student loan debt and all this other stuff. We're not like, all right, Bank of America, like get me a mortgage. That's what I want. And even if we did want that, there's not housing available for us to buy. So as homeownership is increasingly out of reach, we're building political consciousness of a whole new group of people. And that's what gives me hope to beat the real estate industry. Um, and so that's sort of like on the ideological level, on the practical level, like being able to say like on the short term, like, yeah, but also don't take real estate money to fund your campaigns has created a very valuable whose side are you on for the purpose of the short term transitional demands that we need to like get out of this trap of private property. And then the, we need to be fighting internationally. Our targets are international. There are international private equity companies. Money knows no borders. And the reality is that like housing organizers are used to fighting at the local level. We're really used to tenant associations in our building, um, tenant associations on our block. Like we, when we think about housing and home, we're thinking very tight knit local and we need to broaden our thinking as organizers. That's a challenge, but COVID is like, well, whatever, like I'm just as close to Brazil as I am to, you know, my neighbor next door. It's just as easy. So it's also just as hard, right? But like, I do think we're in a moment where in a moment where we are developing our organizing skills to build the movement that we need to work internationally. Thank you. And I'll just say three quick things. Um, first, it's helpful if you can run the national government <laughs> because during a financial crash, the, the real estate industry is on its knees because it's not like um, real estate is not like tables, right? There's a lot of it is inflated value. So Obama squandered the opportunity to socialize housing in 2008 and nine incoming head of Fannie Mae told Obama that they could have just bought out millions and millions of mortgages and simply rented the properties to their tenants at extremely low cost, but they decided not to do that for reasons we can all imagine. But um, if this crisis is ongoing under even a Biden administration and there's significant pressure from the streets and for movements, there will be a real opening because again, during crisis, there's major leverage. Um, in Brazil, obviously under Lula, the Workers' Party government, they were able to launch a massive new home building program. It had many problems, but crisis was the opportunity to increase the public action in the real estate sector. Um, the second point is obviously coalitions do literally work. Um, there are two, Rebney, the real estate board in New York was defeated twice last year. Um, it was defeated by the upstate downstate alliance that SIA helped to lead. Um, 
And second, it was defeated by a coalition of labor, environmental, and housing movements in New York City on um, uh, a bill that the Rebney opposed and that passed 45 to 2 um, because the housing movement came to fight on an environmental bill. Um, and so there are a lot of sub mechanisms we could enter the threat of primaries or whatever, but there are victories, real victories. And then third, I think we have to pick our fights. Um, I think long term public housing construction is essential. But I also think that in the very short term, the idea of intensely increased rent regulation is the non reformist reform that we have to fight on uh, for all the reasons Sia was saying. It's an ideological argument that we can win. Um, they might control our brains, but that's actually easier to change than how much money they have in the short term. Um, and you know, the other point is, again, to get back to this issue with Vienna and productivity, like rents are now so high that they undermine the economy. It is just a real drag on productivity. And even and whether you mean that in a right wing or a left wing way, that people have to live four hours outside of a city to come clean the homes of people who have to live two hours outside of the city. I mean, the system is just kind of like fundamentally broken. And we get into the global financial reasons why that is. But rent regulation as an avenue to kind of creating social housing, which is an idea I've fundamentally got from SIA, is I think very, very, very smart. Um, and that is a terrain I think that we can fight to, to win on. Um, and so concentrating our coalitions around one or two core projects for that initial wedge um, seems like the right way forward. Well, let me pick up on a couple of themes you all have talked about, but let me under, underline something that Sia and Daniel said about the role of ideology. Just a personal anecdote. I used to think that ideological state apparatus was an exaggerated concept until I came to work at NYU. <laughs> and then I realized there is such a thing. It's called NYU. Um, so I, I'm, um, I, I want to, there have been a couple of questions in the chat box about what we learned from the last crisis. Uh, are we going to see a domino effect? Are we going to see these actors buying up distressed properties? Are we going to see a wave of gentrification. So the three of you, what are some of the lessons from the last uh, crisis? Yes, so I think that it's different. The situation is quite different. Um, first of all, the question of death and the proximity of death. Um, opens completely new ways and grounds for the people um, to rethink on previous relation. I think it's, it's like a war. After a war, and a war is the perfect example, a pandemic also is an example like that because you were dealing, you were dealing with an economic harsh, a recession, um, like in other crises and including the financial crisis, but it's different. You are dealing with something mortal. A lot of people are dying. There is a danger of more deaths. And that opens, and I see that, ground for new solidarities and new coalitions. And I think uh, one of the lessons that we must learn from previous crises um, and and the reconstruction after World War One and World War Two were good examples, and Daniel brought them on the table. Is that one of the way to go to reconstruct is back to basis, so back to protect life, and back to protect life. Homes are very essential to that, very necessary and very essential. So I think that what it's very important to learn from other crises is the type of solidarity chains, solidarity bonds that we are creating now during the crisis must be used as ground for permanent policies. And Daniel was saying, yes, we need to build more homes that are on and on a, a green new deal, I, I would say we need immediately to share the spaces that we have, to share in a different way. And we are seeing that happening in a way, you know, without the support 
of the big mobilization of the government, but at the society level is, is happening this share. So I think this can bring, and I, I, I refer also to Marina question, that will be more or less gentrification after the crisis. Um, and it will be different in global north and south. In a way, global north and south are being very close under that. When I see the news about what is happening in New York City with the health system, with nurses, with the people, I see, oh, oh, I see some scenes that seem more like the south. So the south is everywhere now. Uh, so we, if the South is, is everywhere, maybe we can learn also from the South now. Learn from the South means this possibility of people themselves creating new ways of life and creating new, new ways of organizing their lives through solidarity and through a, a new forms of territorial organization. So I think that, uh, that that are the lessons that we have to bring. I am a little bit skeptical about big, big Marshall plans uh, because maybe Marshall plans, as we have seen in the case of Brazil and the Lula uh, with the program My House, My Life, can be more of the same, can be to build more, uh, but to go back to the same way. I know that we're not saying that, we're not referring that, but I think that we have to think now immediately, what are the new ways? And the new ways is the ones that we are living now already, that we are creating now already during the crisis. Um, I guess I would say, say quickly, um, so first lesson is if, like, you know, Fool me once, um, shame on you, but fool me twice, shame on me. So after the 0809 crisis, I mean, who was in the streets in 2008 in the fall demanding like a really good response? Not very many people were. I mean, I went down to Wall Street. I was living in New York. There were maybe 2,000 people there. That's nothing. Um, and so it happened. In early 20, 2009, Obama went in front of the bankers, and we, have this, we talk about this in our book, and he said, I'm the only one standing between you and the pitchforks. And what we say in the book is we need to build solar-powered pitchfork factories. And I think that this time we're not going to settle. Like we learned the lesson of 0809, and we're not going to settle for a very middling bailout simply of the big corporations. So um, I think we do have to figure out exactly what the demands are, and they're different under a potential Biden than under Trump uh, right now. But I think that mobilizing popular rage is very, very important. We have to pick our enemies, name them, and be totally remorseless. And I don't know, maybe it won't end up being landlords. Maybe it'll be banks. Maybe it'll be both. But whoever they are, we have to go after them. And the other point, I agree with you, Hakel, actually, and if I, I might get this wrong, but so correct me if I do, Hakel, but in the Minha Casa Minha Vida program, the huge home construction program under Lula in Brazil, um, something like one or 2% of the housing projects are somewhat controlled by the social movements, the housing movements, but not more than that. And that, they, they canceled that under Bolsonaro, of course. Um, but that number should be far higher. That number should be five, 10, 15. I mean, it should be scaling all the way up. Um, and even so, that social housing controlled by the movements has a lot of important limitations common to public procurement, like they can't do more expensive environmental construction methods, even if it might save money um, in the long term. So I think it is true that as we talk about expanding the public sector, we have to talk about changing and democratizing it um, in the north as well as in the south. And I, you know, you get good poll results for public investment, but I think there is a lot of distrust of the state and the public sector. And we should also think about different, more democratic strategies of managing housing. So when I talk about social housing, that could be community land trust, that could be limited equity, cooperative. I mean, we have to be open to a diversity of um, governance strategies um, so that this is not just replacing Wall Street with um, K Street in Washington, DC. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. I think like the fundamental question for the left has been how can our, how can our solutions scale? Um, and yeah, I guess that's all that I, that's all that I have to say. Like, I think like out of 2008, 2009 in New York, you know, we got like a handful of buildings that we were able to take out of the market, but overwhelmingly 
the right wing was able to scale at a much more effective way. Um, they were able to buy tons of mortgages off, like for every like one like home defenders eviction blockade, stop the foreclosure, made that building a community land converted that multifamily foreclosure into mutual housing. For every one of those, the private equity companies bought like 10,000 homes. Um, so I think that we saw in 2009 some like examples of instances of like how to use and what a world could be. And we sort of leveraged some popular rage around Occupy Wall Street and that sort of translated to a lot of what we're seeing right now. I really do think that. But I think that the left and the solutions that we pose, probably because we're nicer and better, <laughs> have, we have trouble scaling. Like, we, <laughs> I think we do have more people, but we care a lot more about democracy. We care about more about, like, collective control. And, um, and, I, think our and I, I think our challenge is how we are, scale our vision. I'm, I don't have any good ideas yet, but, you know, I hope we get there. I don't want to drop this question of scaling our vision because it's really important. It runs through all the presentations too. But I, well, I wanted to pick up on something that Raquel said and that you were alluding to, Sia and Daniel with too, and it's been coming through in the questions. And this is the people holding the solar powered pitchforks. You know, there is this language in the housing justice movement, right? The city uses it, Sia, I've ever used that housing is an intersectional issue. And then when, when you look around the people at the forefront of the struggle in New York and around the country, it's black and brown people, it's immigrants. It's really a very, it, 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 it's a new emerging coalition that looks different than what was around after Occupy, I think. So I, I'm wondering how, if you were able to talk about that, and Raquel, if you were able to maybe talk about the the Brazilian experience around this, these kinds of solidarities that emerge around housing, Daniel, I wonder, you know, one of the questions that came through was addressed to you, how do we translate the lessons of, uh, someone said, relatively homogenous Vienna to this uh, racially divided country that, uh, that we're talking about. So I, I wonder if one of you wants to take this question up. Let me just uh, reflect a little bit about um, the squatting movement in, in Brazil, in particular in, in Sao Paulo. Uh, for many years, movements have squat empty buildings um, in downtown Sao Paulo, but were squatting basically in order um, to reclaim, reclaim retrofit of the buildings and conversion of the buildings into homes, into apartments, or to uh, ask um, for provision of housing elsewhere. So squatting uh, in order to place themselves, the social movements, as and their demands for housing in the political arena, and then uh, being able to access public housing in the same place or elsewhere. But that, of course, because of, because of, of, of the cup that overthrew the Workers' Party from power in, um, in Brazilian national government, and then after Bolsonaro election, uh, it's very clear for the movements that no deals will be made with social movement and especially with those who are uh, in place and squatting uh, buildings. Then, uh, but during these years and years uh, that people were uh, staying in the squatting, squatter buildings, waiting for the new homes to come or waiting from the projects of retrofit, they simply tried and started to change, change the reality of the building themselves. And also doing that with partnerships 
and support of different groups, of groups of architects, of groups of artists, of cultural groups, of uh, uh, food security groups, and other type of movement, in a way that today the question is not that much we're going to stay here until the time that uh, we're going to gain access to a new fancy public housing somewhere, but we are staying here and we are transforming our lives already now in the place in the place we are living with and counting on the partnerships that were built during these years and years of struggle and fight i think this is a very good example of direct action yes i'm ta i'm talking about a few buildings yes how to scale that how to make that happen in a much broader way i think that in order to scale the most important thing is the successful example that those can bring on the arena that yes it's possible to survive yes it's possible to create a different territory under a different form of organization social organization and tenure relations can i um i actually mainly want to ask a question to sia um which uh, so i want to take this theme that hakel's bringing up which is like what can we do to work with what we have right it would be great and hopefully we will build lots of beautiful new social housing but in the meantime um, and, you know, quickly, I mean, in Vienna, I think they taxed the landlords. I mean, they didn't use imperial earnings, but we could get into that. But I, I guess I'm thinking like places like Berlin um, or other places that have very, very strong rent control creates a different relationship to housing. And see, I feel like I've heard from you a few times this idea that um, very stringent kinds of rent control can essentially convert private market into something that's almost de facto social housing. And I would say that yeah. seems to be scalable. Like, in other words, you could pass national rent control. That's a lot easier than building millions of units. So I don't know. Is that yeah. you're more familiar? Yeah. I mean, I think I think that the fundamental conversation here is like who has power to set the vision for where we live, and so that's why when we talk about public housing, democratically controlled public housing is really important, and that's why when Raquel is talking about the communities and that she's describing um, that. You know, that's a cell it's a created community where the people who are living there are like setting the agenda. And and so, you know, people like home ownership because they like control and that's been perverted by like deep racism and deep classism in our society. So like we have to not have a racist and classist society. And so that's like something we need to think about like deeply. Um, but you know, um we it's about, to me, it's about control and why rent control is really important is because rent control alters the dynamic, the power dynamic between renters and who, who owns the building. And it creates um, an ability to organize where you are. It sort of like creates like have the ability to like have a union um, because you can set the agenda without the fear of being economically displaced or your landlord just not renewing your lease. And so really strong rent controls are not really about making housing more affordable, although they can do that. But I think if we're talking about it that way, we're missing the point. It's about the right to organize. It's about the right to have self-determination over your home. It's about taking collective power away from your landlord to raise your rent and saying, actually, you landlord, you don't have the authority to set the rent here. Um, there's a superstructure that's like bigger than you and they're setting the rent and we live here. And then we can do things like organize a tenant association free from retaliation. We can like put a garden in the backyard free from retaliation. We have like all of these other rights that are like incumbent on the fact that we live there, not incumbent on like how much we can pay or who happens to own the land. And so to me, this is really about like, how can we be creating communities where we live? And, and that's why rent control to me is like just as good as like strong public housing, strong public housing, but it's like very authoritarian, doesn't feel good either, right? So like we do need to like think about like, how we're creating democracy where we live um, that's collective and that's not exclusionary. Um, and I think that's really difficult in the US context because the US context is really racist and classist um, where everyone's like, like looking out for themselves and not for anyone else. And they, so that's hard, right? But like 
public policy can set culture too. Um, so it's a long road, but we're on the right path. Well, let me, I, I, there's, a, there's a, a couple of questions for you, Sia, in particular, but I want to underline this question of rent control. You know, these last couple of days, you've been looking for the history of rent control in the U.S. And one, it's around the economic crisis uh, in the 1920s in New York City. And then the second wave of rent control was after World War II, when the, it was a, a, a war measure. Uh, and then the third instance of rent control was tenant victories in the state of New Jersey. Uh, and in all of those, it was a, a decision that the public welfare is more important than the right to profit. And yeah. if you look at the European countries, you know, the countries that don't have very strong uh, social housing percentage wise. So, for example, Germany has a relatively small amount. They have mm -hmm. incredibly strong rent control and tenant protection which makes everything very different. Uh, but there were a couple of questions about organizing, Sia, and then James was making sure that I ask it. And I would actually love to get uh, Raquel and Daniel to answer this question too. This is from anonymous attendee. They say, I've been trying to organize a tenant association at the building I live here in New York City, but most of the tenants are scared of evictions and the consequences that the landlords can take. What is a strategy to organize tenants that are scared of asking for their rights? I'm suffering from the health crisis and I will not be able to pay rent. I can't stop paying rent alone, but it seems like the other tenants are too scared or uninformed of their rights. So I would ask Sia and then the rest of the panelists, what do we say to this person? Yeah, I mean, that's hard. The reality is, is that organizing is scary and risky. Like we're not gonna win stuff unless we take risks, but it's really hard to take risk alone. And it's um, less scary if you're doing it with your comrades. And so the first thing I would say is like, you know what you need, you shouldn't, the first ask should not be to people who are scared, like go all out, go on a rent strike. Like we're going to the streets. Like that's not the first ask. You gotta get people comfortable. You gotta build trust. You gotta build solidarity and we're in this together. So maybe the first, thing you want to do in this moment is like, hey, I'm suffering from the health crisis. I can't pay my rent. What about you? Like, can we like start a WhatsApp group or a Facebook group for our building? We're going to talk to each other about strategies. Um, maybe that's step one. Maybe it's like, hey, I heard that like, you know, Miss Mossman on like the third, I like, can't get groceries because her mom is sick. Maybe someone can come together to bring her groceries, like build the community first. Um, and you know, some tenants, it's every building is different. And some tenants are gonna be like, can't pay the rent, going on a rent strike, we're ready to go first. But like, that's really rare. And the reality is, is like the first step is like, build the community and then take action, like take action while you're building the community too. So it's like, hey, like I am afraid to like tell the landlord that I can't pay the rent. But like, I think that maybe if we did this together and we formed a tenant association, and we didn't have to put our individual names on it. Like we could say we're the tenant association and we can't pay the rent. Um, and then you can think about ways to escalate it up from there. Um, but I think it's totally normal that people are afraid. Um, we put together a rent strike organizing guide that's not really just about rent strikes. It's also about um, organizing your building under COVID-19. And there's a lot of things that you can do in there, tips to talk to your neighbors, tips to build community in a time of social distancing. Um, and really, I do think it is like forging the bonds with your neighbors that is going to be more important than your bonds with the, with the landlord. Um, and then I think the last thing I would say is it's always helpful to remind your neighbors, like, you can't pay, I can't pay. We're gonna be screwed if we go to the landlord alone, but if we do this together, you're gonna to have more support. Like, I have your back, you have mine, and that's really important. Let me just give you an example, with, which I think it's very meaningful uh, now, is the example of Plataforma de los Afectados por las Hipotecas in uh, Spain, in Barcelona, and, and in other, other cities. Uh, Spanish cities. Um, they, it, it became a very important and powerful movement. And it started only by gathering together people that were having troubles or paying their mortgages and being foreclosed. Just coming together 
and sharing their stories, overcoming the first barrier, because the first barrier is that I have a problem, I am a failure, I cannot pay my rent, I am horrible, <laughs> I am a useless person because I, can, I am unable to pay my rent or my mortgage. When you meet other people, then you realize, oops, oops, it's not my failure. It's, a, it's something which is very big, which is exploiting me, and it's common. And when they started to share the stories, they started to work together and to work in solidarity in the same building, one building to the other building, to the other, to the other, to the other, then it becomes, it became really a very strong movement, a movement that came into even to elect a mayor of a big city, Barcelona, which was a former leader of, of the Plataforma. So I think it, it's a question of building political power, but what comes, and I agree with Sia, is community organizing, is sharing stories, is telling other people your story. Because when you see all the stories together, say, oops, we are a common issue here. And um, maybe we are thousands and hundreds of thousands who have this common issue. And then it starts the whole thing. Yeah. Um, I don't have anything to add on the mechanics of tenant organizing. I mean, Sia knows that better. And I think you have a really powerful answer that speaks to everything I've heard. Um, I would just say, brief, I mean, I wish we had another hour because I, you know, something that's come up in Sao Paulo when talking about the housing movement there is, People in the housing movement there say to me, like, you know, Daniel, it's only middle class people who want to do social tenancy housing. What we want is to own our homes. And I think it's, it would be interesting and maybe another conversation to talk about the different ways the ideology of homeownership goes. And yet you don't have people in Berlin. They're not like, oh, I want to own my own home. They're like, I want more rent control. So I don't know. There's some kind of like phase shift or, or like paradigm shift that, that we have to find out a way to achieve. And um, I think in another time it might be really interesting to talk about the ways that these ideologies kind of cross borders um and how to deal with them because i think you know Sia and Hakel are both right to think that like it's um collective control of the home spans different kinds of things uh it has to be democratic and etc but there, there are these common challenges so i think it'd be cool to get into them sometime. totally that happens so much in new york you know mm -hmm. like we don't want rent control we want to be homeowners like white people got to be homeowners why don't we get to be homeowners you know there's like a lot of that it's but it also is generational, so it's interesting. It's, it's generational and also is the fact that, I mean, there was being put forward as the one and only, one and only. And the real experience besides that was the experience of permanent transitoriness. So how can we overcome permanent transitoriness without being homeowners? So this is the question. Amazing. Well, we've touched on a lot of things tonight. One thing I learned uh, with the Workers' Party in Brazil is that uh, good socialists don't run over long meetings because we're either in charge of social reproduction or there's people in the meeting participating with you who, who want to get to that. So I wanted to ask each of the panelists, uh, thanking you so much for your interventions, if there's any final thoughts uh, and comments uh, that you want to make, and maybe James, you want to put something in the chat about how people can stay connected uh, to this campaign and to this discussion. I don't know who wants to go first. Maybe Sia? Sure, I'll go first. Um, so, my final thought is that you should get involved in organizing with your neighbors and you shouldn't feel scared about that. Um, telling your story is the most important thing. Organizing might feel scary, but it's really just talking to people and asking them to do stuff with you, um, which we all do all the time. So don't get, um, so I would say get involved in the housing justice movement. We need you now more than ever. Please sign our petition. Please try and talk to your neighbors. Um, people really want to talk to other people right now. So it, this is our moment. Um, so, you know, I'm happy to provide support to anyone who's working on that. And I can't wait to win some stuff. Yeah, the only thing I can say is yes, join the housing justice movement. 
go to rent strike. Cancel rent is a very important campaign and this is, is meaningful, not only for the US, is meaningful everywhere. Is meaningful also in Sao Paulo, Brazil, is meaningful in other cities of uh, Latin America where there is a lot of, of, of renters who are unable to pay the rent. Stop evictions. This is very, very important. Can be from rent arrears, from other reasons, evictions must stop now. And then from that ground on, we can build a new ground for the housing movement and the right to housing everywhere. So uh, I, I, I thank you very, very much for this opportunity to listen for your struggles, your organizing efforts and your proposal. And also let's, let's keep in touch and share much more. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I'm extremely honored to, to have been on this um, panel. Um, I think one foundation for the reconstruction will be um, reading Hakel's book, um, Urban Warfare, and, and all of her work. Um, I take from it that there will be likely again, as there was last time, a huge alliance between the financial industry and public powers to use home construction as a way out of the crisis, and yeah. especially as a way out of the crisis for the financiers and the landlords. Um, but that means that there will be something to fight over, that home building will be on the agenda again, and we have everything to fight for um, in that. And this time, unlike last time, we have Hakel's fabulous work, the work of all the housing movements that she has worked with and learned from, um, our own movements here in the US and movements around the world. So I think, you know, endless struggle is coming, but we have good ideas, we have a, a vision, um, and I think we can have a very good future uh, if we organize and if we win. Well, thank you very much to everyone. Super honored to be in this conversation with you. All great conversations are ones that raise more questions than give final answers, and this was amazing. And I put an invitation on the chat box where the Urban Democracy Lab is hosting an event on Thursday where we're going to talk with Mohammed Atia, uh, Ilana Berger, and someone from Amazonians United about some of the frontline labor organizing that's been going on around New York City. We hope you join us. And thank you so much, NYC, DSA, Verso Book, Urban Democracy, we have Defend Democracy in Brazil and the panelists for making this event so successful. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, James. Thanks, bye -bye. James. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Woo! Woo, we did it. <laughs>